Well, good morning. Welcome to Wildwood Church. We are glad that you have joined with us online to worship this morning. Uh, this morning for our call to worship, we are going to do uh, recite together the Apostles' Creed. Now, why would we recite the Apostles' Creed? The Apostles' Creed uh, is written uh, somewhere around uh, 300 A.D., and in that time, uh, during that time in church history, uh, it was in a lot of ways what united the church, what clarified doctrine for the church, um, but what also was their curriculum at that time. And, and for a lot of us during this coronavirus uh, season almost, uh, it, for a lot of us, especially in vocational ministry, uh, we've really considered what does it mean um, to be a basic level church? What does the Bible call us to, to be a church? The Apostles' Creed, in a lot of ways, clarifies for us. Now, depending on what your background is, that word creed can do all kinds of things for you. Some of you grew up and the creeds are near and dear to your heart. Um, and, and for some, uh, creeds uh, were used negatively. The creed, as Matt Chandler says, the creed is much like the moon. It reflects the light and the heat of scripture. It holds no light and heat, no authority in and of itself, but a creed reflects the light and the heat of scripture. And so this morning, we're going to stand as a church spread out all over Tallahassee, and we're going to recite the Apostles' Creed together. So would you stand with me as we say this together? I believe in God, the Father Almighty maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Jesus, we come and we worship you for all the things that we just recited together. We love you. We thank you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Good morning, Wildwood. Glad to be with you. Let's sing this together. I raise a hallelujah In the presence of my enemies I raise a hallelujah Louder than the unbelief I raise a hallelujah My weapon is a melody I raise a hallelujah Yes I do As heaven comes to fight for me Oh I'm gonna sing In the middle of
on a frame And you walked in the pain And now you're taking us higher You stepped into time And you laid down your life to save us You took all our shame And on the cross it was be the same will never be the same we go from glory to glory to glory we're forever changed we're forever changed you call me
submission all is at rest I am my savior happy and blessed uh, Jesus regardless of the coronavirus regardless of the storms that swept through the south this week Lord we can sing that we are at rest not based off of our circumstances Lord but a, a soul rest that comes from knowing that you have paid everything on our behalf that you are sovereign and you are good and you are in control. Lord, that happiness that we sing of, it's not flippant. It's not silly. Lord, it's a, it's a happiness that is rooted in your nature and in your character. And so as we see what feels like at times chaos ensuing around us, Lord, we sing, I am my Savior, happy and blessed. So Lord, where at times our head and our heart don't connect, where at times we can acknowledge that intellectually, but we have trouble believing it with our very lives, Lord, would you help us to do that even this week? Lord, would you help us to remember as things seem hectic and yet calm all around us, things seem chaotic, and yet at the same time, things have slowed down physically. Uh, Lord, as we um, witness all of that, Lord, would your spirit testify to our hearts of the good news that we have in Christ that through submitting our lives to you, everything is at rest. Our heart can be at rest. Lord, would you be with the leaders in our city as there's just a lot of decisions to be made day in and day out? Would you grant wisdom to local leaders? Would you grant wisdom to national and global leaders, Lord, as they try to uh, understand uh, this virus as they try to understand what it means to close down and to open up. Lord, would you grant wisdom uh, even to those who are far off from you? Lord, would your common grace bestow wisdom on the leaders of our country and on the leaders of our city? Lord, would you give our church wisdom on how to operate in this time and how to continue to worship, continue to function as a church and trust you and still be obedient to the scriptures, still be obedient to the things that you have called us. Would you prompt us when we need to step out in faith and would you caution us, Lord, when we need to play it uh, and be cautious? Lord, we are grateful that we don't walk uh, through things like this in darkness or in blindness, Lord, that we have you to lead us and to guide us. We have your word that reminds us day in and day out of your character and, and reminds us how to act and how to live in a way that glorifies you. Lord, where there's fear, uh, would you give peace? Where there's anxiety, would you give peace? Lord, where, where people are restless, Lord, would you grant them rest? Lord, we know that that comes from knowing and understanding you and who you are. And so, Lord, would you shine the light on your son on those who don't know you in the midst of this time? And would you allow them to experience that same joy, that same rest, that same hope that we get to experience in Christ? Lord, we trust you. We trust your character. We trust you because we can look back on the cross. We can look back on the resurrection and we can see that your promises ring true. And so we trust you. We trust your heart. We trust your goodness. We trust your love for us. It's in all these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We just want to make you aware of and remind you about the Cross Before Me uh, book conversation that we're encouraging the whole church to have. We're, we're calling it a conversation and not a study because we want to clarify that, that we as believers, we, we study and we engage with Scripture continually. Uh, but every once in a while, there is a book that highlights something in Scripture really well. And so the pastoral staff has encouraged the congregation to get this book, The Cross Before Me by Rankin Wilburn, uh, and to begin
begin to read it as we have a church-wide conversation around it. You may uh, talk about it in your small group. You may engage uh, with your neighbors on it at a social distance, of course. Um, but we also want to encourage you to tune in next week uh, on the Wildwood Church uh, YouTube channel, the same one that you can tune into to watch the services. And there will be a live conversations with some of our pastors and leaders here on staff around the book that you can see uh, live streamed at that time. Uh, also, we just want to say thank you for those who continue to give. We know that in this time uh, where a lot of things just seem to be uncertain, uh, that many of you continue to give and to continue to support the ministry. So thank you. Uh, at, at this time, if you want to give um, a, as a part of our offering, as a part of worship, you can do so in the app. Uh, you can do so at the website, and you can also mail in a check. Again, thank you uh, so much for doing that.
Jesus, you are our hope. You are our plea. In times of desperation, God, I pray that we would run to you, knowing that yours is the only name that can save. Yours is the only name that can give us life, that can give us new identity. Yours is the only name that reminds us that our past before you is not counted against us, that you have wiped the slate clean. You've forgiven us and lifted us up and called us your own. God, we are eternally thankful. We love you. We praise you. We pray all this in your name. Amen. Well, hello, everyone. We hope you're well and uh, taking care of yourself during this unusual time. We have one passage of scripture to read in our study of 1 Corinthians 13 uh, this week, and it is uh, 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4. It says this, love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. I think for a certain number of us, the novelty of this current situation is now wearing thin. Our COVID-19 character may be getting a little bit smelly. And what I mean by that is uh, we're more impatient, more short-tempered, more critical, and perhaps we're speaking to our pets, our dogs, uh, way more kindly than we're speaking to our children. Now, ironically, uh, there are some others of us whose volatile elements of their character have actually been more subdued because you're not around people. Uh, people uh, are not bothering you, they're not in your face, they're not triggering you, and it's very rare that anybody uh, is critical of themselves or impatient with themselves or you know, um, can't stand themselves, right? But it reminds me of the guy that was uh, stranded alone on a, on a desert island for over 20 years. And when he was finally rescued, the people that came noticed that he had three huts. So they said, what are these huts that you made here? And he said, well, the first one is my house. What's the second one? He said, well, that's my church. Well, then what's this third hut? And he said, well, that's where I used to go to church. <laughs> because uh, we have a hard time getting along in, in stressful situations. So it's very providential, I think, in our timing that we're focusing now on the nature of love from 1 Corinthians 13, because some of us need to be reminded of just what the Bible says in times of stress and anxiety. Last week, David set the stage well for us uh, by telling us why 1 Corinthians 13 is even in the Bible. I mean, it wasn't that uh, Paul one day uh, activated his inner poet and decided to write some lofty prose about uh, the nature of love. He didn't look down the corridors of time and say, you know, one day people are gonna be doing lots of weddings and I wanna give them something beautiful to read uh, during the ceremony. He wrote this chapter because love was blatantly absent in the church at Corinth. Now this, uh, several verses, from verses four to seven in particularly, show us how rotten the church was. I mean, Paul in this letter speaks of divisions and envy and immaturity and conflict and poor choices, even immorality. So you can see why this chapter is really critical. That's why he tells us in verses one through three that no matter how uh, much uh, faith you have, how many gifts you have, how much knowledge you have, you know, how uh, sacrificial you are, you might even uh, be so sacrificial to the point of martyrdom, he says if, if you don't have love as the foundation and root of everything you do, uh, it's worthless. Uh, if you have no love, we have nothing, we are nothing, we gain nothing. And of course, the kind of love that's being described here is not just any old love, it's agape love. It's the same kind of love that we find in John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave. And so as we begin to look at these qualities of love, this, uh, these, uh, these definitions, you might say, of love or descriptions of it, let's realize that uh, in our flesh, we don't have any power to do this. We have no power to love in the manner that is reflected in these verses, unless the Holy Spirit of God is resident in our lives and activating us to really live these things out in significant ways. Uh, the fruits of the Spirit from Galatians 5, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, 
See, these are in our verse here this morning. Uh, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. These are the things that the Spirit grips a person with and allows them to experience in varying degrees of maturity. So this morning we're gonna do two things. The first is look at these characteristics uh, from the standpoint of the character of God. And then secondly, we're going to look at them in terms of our own ability to live them out in our homes and our marriages and in our, com- our church community uh, at large. Let's take patience and kindness. Uh, the Greek word for patience always describes patience with people, uh, ne- never circumstances, okay? It's always patience with someone who potentially is aggravating us. In the Bible, uh, you see the word uh, where God is long-suffering or he is uh, slow to anger. Uh, this means the Lord is constantly restraining himself uh, in the face of provocations. And you say, well, where do those provocations come from? Well, they come from all of us. They come from, from us every day, and certainly they come from the, the non-Christian world. And see, if I ran the universe, I would have blown this thing up a long time ago because of the nature of human beings and their uh, complete disregard for the character and, and person of, of God. And uh, sometimes I say, Lord, why do you, why do you let these people Um, just mock you to your face. You know the answer that I get back, not not audibly or verbally, but just in terms of understanding the nature of scriptures, the Lord says to me, why do I allow you to keep living? Why didn't I take your life when you were 17 and you were 18 and 19 and, and disregarding me? Why didn't I take your life then? It's because God is patient In fact, this is the reason the world continues. His patience is the whole basis of it. Look at 2 Peter 3, verse 9. It says, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you. It's the same word, macrothumia. Not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. The fact that the world goes on day after day in the state it's in is a result of God's infinite patience toward those of us who are lost. Uh, God is also kind. Uh, Look at Luke 6.35. But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be like the sons of the Most High, for he is, look at the word, kind to the ungrateful and the evil. That's a, a powerful statement. God is kind because he sees uh, the human condition, he sees, the, he sees the human race, he sees the brokenness and the lostness uh, and, and the darkness and the blindness, and yet his kindness goes forth as it went forth to you. Some of you didn't become Christians until later in your lives, and the reason you're here now is because God was kind to you and patient all along the way. Uh, the sun shines on the just and the unjust, Uh, People deny him and turn away from him, and and in spite of this, he pours out good gifts, amazingly good gifts on people, as the the passage says. Uh, I try to take a a walk every day for an hour or so, and I'll pass people on on a nice, pleasant spring morning, and we'll say, hey, how you doing? Beautiful day. Ah, beautiful day. And for all I know, there are people who hate God, have no interest in him, no interest in the gospel, no interest in things that matter. And they're getting the same blessings and the same privileges as a child of God, because God is infinitely kind. Now there's a passage that combines patience and kindness. It's Romans uh, 2.4, where Paul is speaking to uh, moralistic people, and he says, do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? It, It isn't It isn't his threats or his foreboding or his anger. It's not fear that grips our hearts. It's it's God's goodness. It's meant to lead people to say, I I can't believe you as this being would love me in the state that I am. I think if this is the case, then perhaps we need to sort of reconsider how we relate to the people around us. You know, our kids, our spouses, uh, employees, uh, friends. Uh, because critical, caustic, complaining, carping, threatening, you know, reactions to the people around us are, are not going to win them over. Uh, 
We don't win anybody's heart by those reactions. Uh, those are not effective in promoting long-term change. What's effective is kindness and grace and goodness and mercy. That's what should melt the human heart and melt people in relationships with one another. Those other things actually drive people away from us. Of course, when it comes to the example of Jesus, God incarnate, he is the epitome of patience and kindness. Uh, Dane Ortland has a book called Jesus, Gentle and Lowly, and uh, um, Eric Ryan was talking about this the other day and said, uh, that, and, and it says this in the book, that the only time Jesus ever mentions his own uh, sort of internal heart attitude is when he says something in uh, Matthew 11, what is it, 11, uh, 29, I think we have that on the screen here for you, where Jesus says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. And then he says, I am gentle and lowly in heart. You think about that, Jesus says, I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls. In his book he says this, and when Jesus tells us what animates him most deeply, what is most true of him, when he exposes the innermost recesses of his being, what we find there is gentle and lowly. Jesus is not trigger happy, he's not harsh, he's not reactionary, he's not easily exasperated. He's the most understanding person in the universe. The posture most natural to him is not a pointed finger, but open arms. Come, come, rest, rest in my presence. This is what patience and kindness means in the character of God. What about envy in the character of God? How does this relate to his very being. Well, the word envy is to have an intense, negative, even destructive uh, feeling toward another's achievements or successes or accomplishments, right, or possessions, right? Uh, people go through life constantly thinking about what they don't have. And oftentimes it rises to the level of covetousness to such a degree that, that people rejoice when someone else's good fortune is destroyed. This is happening all the time. I, I just wonder in the heart of hearts how many pastors are secretly gloating when another ministry fails because it makes them look better. I know, I know that happens in, in pastoral thinking. But here's the point. God cannot be envious because he already owns the cattle on a thousand hills, right? He owns everything. There's nothing that he needs. But here's the, here's the real re reality about him. He's also not selfish, He's not saying, well, I have all that I need and I don't need to give anymore. God's nature is to give. He doesn't resent people's possessions and he gives us all blessings we don't even deserve. I just love Matthew 7.11. That's a, a fantastic verse. It, it says this, if, if you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? The Lord is, is interested in pouring out upon you things that really matter, things that, that he would consider valuable for you to have. Because giving, uh, not taking, is the heart of love. Giving away. And that's why John 3.16 is so powerful. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. First John 4, 10, this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be a propitiation for our sins. So envy has no place in the character of God because God is a giver, he's not a taker. And then finally, we're told in here that love does not boast, it is not arrogant. What does this have to do with the character of of God. Of course, the opposite of arrogance and, and boasting is what? We would call it a humility, as someone who lives uh, with a humble frame. Because true love doesn't focus on itself, it focuses on the needs of, of other people. Uh, John Piper uh, was asked recently a very provocative question. He said, <laughs> he was asked this, is God humble? In other words, is the everlasting, almighty, exalted, glorified creator of the universe, humble. And you think, wow, that's, that's really uh, difficult. I never really studied that in seminary, right? See, God calls for his name to be exalted and glorified, right? Uh, he tells the world that he is 
great and mighty and powerful and awesome. Uh, that's like the opposite of humility, right? So uh, people have asked very critically, is God an egomaniac? Because he calls people to exalt his greatness. Well, well let's say this. If, if you or I did this, if we said, my name must be magnified above all names, then it would be morally degenerate and insane. So why not with God? Well, here's, here's something that Piper said, and I'm not quoting, but it's, it's sort of the, the gist of his argument. He says, God doesn't exalt himself because of ego or arrogance, but because of love. What he means by that is the most loving thing God can do is to see his name exalted because we as human beings need him to be the greatest being in the universe, our complete sufficiency, our total advocate, the all-satisfying one. If we don't have him as those things, as our temporal and eternal and everlasting peace and happiness, if he is not that for us, then we are doomed. Unless God is God, we're doomed. So in one hand, no, God is not humble in the sense that we're called to be humble. Because our humility is based on our need to think and act and live as though we are not God, right? That's not who I am. I need to be somebody that I really am, and that's not who I am. In fact, I am dependent and weak and sinful and mortal by nature. That's who I am. But God can't wake up in the morning if he were to ever sleep and say, you know, I'm not really God because he is God. He will always be God forever and ever. Humility is recognizing what you are and what you are not. But it was because of our pride and ego and arrogance, let's understand this, right? Originally, our rebellion, our, our desire to be in charge, that God did the unthinkable. He takes on human nature to do what God as God could not do, but he could do what he could do when the Son of God became an incarnate man and took on human nature. He then could humble himself, as Philippians 2.8 says, to the point of death, even death on a cross. So Jesus Christ was the most humble person that ever lived. Now, how does this affect us? Let's move to that second category. How do, how do these qualities, uh, how, are they, how are they called to impact us as people? Let's take patience and kindness, first of all. We are called to exhibit patience and kindness. That's what love looks like. Of course, you know, the most dangerous prayer you can ever pray is, Lord, give me patience, right? People that have prayed that have been put through lots of, <laughs> lots of misery in their lives. Uh, because people have been brought into their lives that have uh, demanded that those prayers look, you know, are answered in, in very real ways by creating patience in that person. Uh, patience is a virtue of not reacting swiftly. It, it's long-suffering. It's, it's putting up with provocations. And let me just say this for, for parents. This, this doesn't mean in the case of your children, uh, you need to let them get away with disobedience. You know, that's not what we're saying, but what it does mean, if, if you learn patience, it means the impulsive flare-ups uh, go away, or at least they become less and less. The impulsive flare-ups uh, of, your, of your heart. And, and why? Well, you know, why, why would that be true if you understood patience? Because it's decisive, and this is a humbling thing, it's decisive to recognize that your child or your spouse or your fellow church member or your neighbor is not causing you to be impatient. All they're doing is revealing it. They are the trigger mechanism for the impatience to flood out of your heart. The cause of true impatience in, in me and in you is not other people's stupidity or incompetence or laziness or unthoughtfulness. It's my own need for control, it's my agenda, my pride, my critical and judgmental spirit, my fear, and even my lack of perception and understanding and wisdom. Those are the real reasons we're impatient. And those are things not to blame other people for, but to say, God, I'm an impatient person because impatience resides in my heart. 
And if we would come to grips with this, I think we'd have a little better handle on uh, why we blow off. Even this lack of perspective, I think, is interesting. We, we had a child that was constantly aggravating us because he couldn't get one subject. We had tutors help each week. Tutors would come, and then he'd take the test the next week, and he wouldn't do well on it, and this would go on, and went on like that for, I mean, several years. And our uh, feeling is this is a character problem. It's a problem of effort. It's a you know, problem of uh, uh, you know, focus. And so finally, um, after high school, we went on to FSU and, and had a certain selected uh, battery of tests. And so the evaluator comes down and sits with us and th throws the report on the table and, and, and looks at, at, at my child and says, you know, son, it's amazing that you've done as well as you've done, given some of the uh, learning challenges you have in this area. And when the evaluator said that, my wife burst into tears. We walked out the door asking our son to forgive us for being aggravated for all the wrong reasons. It wasn't that he wouldn't, it's that he couldn't. Do you have a child like that? You're mad at them, you're frustrated, you're, you're just uh, unglued. Maybe they need to be tested to see if there's something going on in them that's causing their you know, reactions. We learned a lesson, and my wife's an educator. You learned a lesson about four or five years too late. There's so much in Scripture about bearing with one another, putting up with one another, forgiving one another, all these one another passages. How amazing it would be if, if we as a group of people would not carry judgment and impatience in our hearts, but genuine compassion for others for the simple reason that we confess that people need to bear with us as well. Because we don't see ourselves very well. We see ourselves way better than other people. That's our basic bent. And to be able to say, God, other people need to bear with me as much as I have to bear with them. Let me learn through the power of your spirit to be a patient man and withhold judgment and criticism and reaction. And kindness is the sense that you get when you're around a person who doesn't make you afraid. A kind person will never create fear in you. Uh, there may be things I need to learn from this person. There may be things that he can convict me over. But kindness does not intimidate or frighten or dominate. This is why I believe Jesus was called the friend of sinners. Why, why people who were the outcasts of that society flocked to him. And, and wanted to be around him. And his enemies called him a friend of sinners because he loved them and they knew it because he was ultimately kind. He was truthful and he was forthright, but he, he, he allowed people to retain the dignity of their personhood. That's what a kind individual will do. Let me remind you as a Christian that you possess a very dangerous weapon. You say, I know, I know what it is. It's, it's my tongue. You know, I know my, my tongue is a weapon. No, it's something more basic than that. You know the weapon you possess? It's the truth. It's truth. And by golly, if you have truth, you just speak it into people's lives, don't you? It's the truth, and you'll hammer, and you'll hit, and you'll punch, and you may destroy, and you may leave a trail of rubble behind you a mile long of relationships and kids and people and spouses because you've spoken the truth but you've never spoken the truth in a way that allows people to retain their dignity of their personhood because you're not kind. Jesus was kind. He was truthful and kind at the same time and this is what God is calling us to do and be in our lives. What about envy? What would happen if Marriages and families and the church family uh, eliminated envy from our lives. Uh, jealousy and envy is uh, the modus operandi of, of children, right? Uh, when our kids uh, complain that the other kid got a bigger piece of the cake, what we started doing, a lot of you do the same thing, we, uh, we let the, one of the kids cut the cake. We said, okay, uh, here's, the, here's the deal. If you cut the cake, the other guy gets first pick. And man, they were like this. 
they're cutting the cake, you know, right down the middle because they didn't want the other guy to get a bigger piece, right? Uh, because uh, they have this real sense of, of uh, you know, somebody's got a, uh, something that they don't have. There's an envy, jealousy factor in, in children. Uh, and kids are notorious for calling things unfair, for snipping out who has an advantage. And they do this because of self-centeredness and self-protection. This is just the way we all grew up. And all of this is the opposite of sacrificial love. You know you truly love someone when you're happy for their successes even though you don't have any of it yourself. You can say without any question, I, I'm so glad that this happened to you. I'm so glad that this honor came to you. I'm so glad that you were recognized. I'm so, I'm so thankful because I know that's encouraging to you. I love you so much, I want you to experience these things. Envy would never allow you to do that. Envy would cause you to be embittered and frustrated and angry. Uh, I'm, I'm stunned with Paul's words, uh, his willingness to sacrifice something that he had for the sake of someone else. Look at Romans 9, 1 through 3. This is probably the greatest thing anybody has ever said uh, to, um, to another human being. We have, that, we have that on the screen, though. We don't have Romans 9, 1 through 3. Paul basically says this, he says, I am willing to give up my salvation. Think about that. I'm, I'm willing to sacrifice my relationship with Jesus. If my fellow countrymen, the Jews, would come to know him. In other words, I would go to hell for their sake. I, I don't know anybody that could ever say that with a straight face. I, I don't know if I could say that. So not only do I not want to take something away from another person, Paul says, I'm willing to give up what I have for the sake of another person. That's how his character was shaped. Paul didn't have envy in his own life. Can you rejoice that your friend's child got into a, a nice school, FSU or UF, and your child did not? Can you really rejoice in that? It takes the power of the Spirit to do that. Can you be happy if a buddy gets a promotion, although you both worked equally hard? He gets the promotion and you haven't? Can you be okay with uh, your Pilates partner, you know, who just moves to an upscale neighborhood and you wonder, well, I don't know if I can be her friend anymore because, uh, you know, this, this makes me uncomfortable. We don't, you know, my, my husband's just kind of, you know, kind of a schluck and he doesn't make that kind of money. You know? Can you be okay with that? And one of the more painful ones, can you, can you rejoice with a couple that just had their fourth baby and you, and you have none? That is so painful. We're not saying it's not painful. We're not saying that it doesn't hurt. We're saying, do you want them to have it taken away from them? You wish it didn't happen to them because it hasn't happened to you. Loving reactions rejoice in other people's blessings because God rejoices in the blessings he gives to all of us. Love is not boastful or arrogant. How does this play out in our lives? Well, there's, there's one compelling reason why arrogance is denounced in Scripture. It's James 4, 6. God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Love by its very nature is other-centered. It looks out for the interest of others. That's what Philippians 2 says. It puts other, other people's interests and concerns and, and uh, you know, desires and preferences ahead of their own. And if, 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 our, if our homes just reflected you know, a little bit of this, they would be different places. You know, some of us wake up in the morning and say, what's in this for me? Arrogance by nature is self-consumed, self-inflated, self-important. We've always said there's two types of people that walk in a room. One says, ah, here I am. And the other says, well, there you are. Let me ask you, what kind of person are you walking into a room? Oh, if you're an introvert, you're just over in the corner, I know. But are you a here I am person or are you a there you are person? Where, where, where is your focus of attention in people's lives. The folly of arrogance is graphically taught by John Calvin when he said that human pride is like an ant gloating in you know, its vanity that its dung heap is a little bit higher than another ant's. <laughs> From God's perspective, I mean, it's, it's ridiculous that arrogance 
would captivate our hearts. It's insidious. We all struggle with it at certain levels. Uh, someone once said, I think it may have been Spurgeon or one of the other ancient preachers, he said, pride is like the sin of a thousand angles. Wherever you turn, you're bumping into it. It's jabbing you everywhere you turn around. I remember in a, when I became a Christian in college, um, I was in a speech class, and uh, I was kind of a radicalized Christian guy. I was witnessing everybody, and I didn't care what people thought of me, and I wish I had more of that in me now. And uh, I remember reading 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7 to the, to the class. You know, love is patient and kind, doesn't boast. And, and I, I said, does anybody know where that comes from? And, and actually, nobody knew. It's kind of weird. In 1971, no, nobody knew where that came from. And I just sort of arrogantly announced, well, that's from the Bible. You know, I was sort of proud that I, uh, I could kind of lay that on them. Like, see, in your face, people. The Bible's pretty cool, isn't it? You know, I found uh, I was proud even talking about a passage of Scripture that tells me not to be proud. Because pride rears its head everywhere. Here's why it's so awful, because at the heart of pride and arrogance is a hunger for significance and validation and identity and respect. That's what you're looking for when you're an arrogant, boastful person. Arrogance is the attitude. Boasting is kind of the verbal outbursts of that, right? Most people seek it in performance and status and their careers and their children, their ethnicity, their money, their education. And so they talk about it. Christian, what about you? Why do you nurture a self-inflated importance, sense of importance, where you constantly talk about what you've done, who you know, you talk other people down, perhaps, why your view of things is superior, you incessantly focus on subjects only interesting to you? Why do you do that? Does the power of Jesus and his I grace to you and your identity in him where, where your significance and your security are in him and he says you know you're my beloved son and you're my wonderful daughter w wouldn't that put a little damper on your desire to boast and to be important self-important I love the actress who was poking fun at self-centeredness and she said well I'm, I'm sort of tired of talking about me so let me ask you a question what do you think of me <laughs> Everybody wants to talk about themselves. I love the story of William Carey. Of course, Carey was the father of uh, modern missions, right? Um, William Barclay brings this out. He says, the really great man never thinks of his own importance. William Carey began his life as a, uh, as a cobbler. He was one of the greatest missionaries and certainly one of the greatest linguists the world has ever known. Carey translated the Bible into some 30 or 34 Indian languages. That's how, that's how skilled he was. And when he came to India, he was regarded with dislike and contempt. At, at a dinner party, a snob, with the idea of humiliating him, said in a tone that everyone could hear, he said, I suppose, Mr. Carey, you once worked as a shoemaker. No, your lordship, Carey answered, not a shoemaker, only a cobbler. A cobbler is a guy who repairs shoes. He doesn't even make shoes. Carey said, no, I'm not, I wasn't even that good. Just a cobbler. He did not even claim any importance, even in that rather you know, lowly occupation. You know why? Because William Carey's identity was not in anything that the world offered him. It was in Jesus. That's how arrogance kind of gets laid aside in our lives. Now, as we close, let's realize the greatest example of humility is Jesus. He gave up glory and honor and his you know, rights to meet my needs and your needs before he ever concerned himself with his own comforts. That's what Philippians 2.8 says, that he humbled himself and became obedient 
to the point of death, even death on a cross. What would a marriage look like or a family or a church community if we had our focus on the welfare of the other person? If we, we gloried in their successes, we gloried in, in their happiness, we didn't care so much about our own, we, we, we didn't care who got recognized. Uh, I love working around here because we have a, a bunch of pastors who aren't interested in being recognized. I couldn't work with people that I thought needed to be recognized. I think we have a worship team and we have student ministry people and we have our children's ministry and all of our staff. I mean, these are folks who, they're not, they're not in us for their glory. And this is why this is a good place to work. What would it be like if we were fighting for one another's rights Instead of our own places of honor, we had no superstars, no drama kings or queens, no prima donnas. We don't have any prima donnas on our worship team. Because there are people who recognize they're just here to serve Jesus and that's good enough. It's that sort of marriage and that sort of family and that sort of church that just might make a difference in the world. And I have to say one more thing and I have just four minutes left. I was asked to consider this last word as well. I'm a game or I'm a uh, a rule follower, so I'll I'll do what I was asked to do, and that's the word rude. You know, God certainly isn't rude, but the the word means to behave indecently, to cause someone to blush, okay? Uh, To to be crass or crude, maybe uncouth or smutty or profane, you know, something like that along those lines. And guys have a problem with this. You know, hey, I've been in a lot of locker rooms. I know what it's like to hear jokes and I know what it's like to tell jokes. And people may laugh at your cleverness and your, uh, your double entendres, you know, they, they laugh at all that stuff and they think, and they think you're funny and, and all of that, but, but the goal of your life isn't to make people laugh and to show them how clever you are with your kind of play on words. The goal in life is to make people better. The goal of life is to make them more like Jesus Christ. To leave them in a better place than when you found them. And the way you do that, of course, is by encouraging and building up and heartening them and refreshing them and energizing them in some way that they can say, you know what? That person breathes life into me. And if you're a rude person, that will never happen. You'll make them laugh, but you won't make them better. This is how we love. It is how your Savior loved you. He leaves you in a better place with every encounter you have with him that's meaningful. Remember, his posture is not the pointed finger, is it? His posture is the open arms. Without love, we have nothing, we gain nothing, we are nothing. With love, we have everything, we are everything, and we gain everything worthwhile. I hope this journey in this chapter and in this book and in these verses will inspire you to ask yourself the question, God, I'm not a very good lover, would you make me a better lover? I want to be more like Jesus because that's why you created me. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we want to thank you for the the privilege of looking at this passage of scripture, looking at your character and how you have exemplified patience and kindness, how you never exemplified envy, and how you never boasted or were arrogant and certainly not rude, and how these things are meant now to apply to us as people. Please show us what you want us to learn. Guide our hearts and direct our paths and make us the kind of men and women that we're called to be. I pray that in this season of higher tensions that love would reign in our homes. We would realize our impatience is not caused by other people, it is simply triggered by them that all of these ugly things are in our hearts. Grant us much grace because we have been shown much grace. 
The patience of our Savior and our God is enormous toward us. And so we give you the greatest of thanks. Help us to love like this. Only you can do that through the power of your Spirit. And we ask you to have mercy on us now. And with gratitude we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. celebrating successes in your life or in the lives of your children and the lives of other people's children. But the point is, is that the center of your identity? Is, is that the source of your significance and your security? Uh, we ought to celebrate all sorts of good things that happen in all sorts of people's lives. But the center of your identity and security is always Jesus. And that would allow you to say, 
If you were in William Carey's shoes and someone said, well, Mr. Carey, uh, you were just a shoemaker. Pride people would say, well, you don't understand. I'm one of the greatest linguists in the history of the world. You know, I've translated 34 Indian languages into the Bible. He didn't say that. He said, no, I'm not a shoemaker. I'm just a cobbler. I just repair shoes. His identity was so much in Jesus. There was no need for arrogance or boasting. That's, that's the key to a life in a community that really hums for God. Let's ask God to make us that as we go forward. Lord, would you bless our dear members and our friends, people who are watching, uh, maybe in places we don't even know. Meet their needs and, and, and protect us in this time. May your grace be sufficient. We love you and we love each other. We want everyone to know how much they're loved, how much we care about them, and help us to continue to minister to the needs the best we're able as you see us through this difficult time. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, you may go in peace. Let's sing. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Wildwood, have a great week.